Hello, and welcome to Reawaken the Dream, a course for the writer, mom, or anyone who has to write in small fragments of time because you don't have enough opportunity to just sit down and devote yourself solidly to writing. We give you a set of very practical tools that let you write consistently and coherently across broken segments of time. And if you're new here, well, we're on lesson 18, our 13th character trait. It's all on a playlist. You probably want to start back with lesson one. Or maybe if you aren't interested in learning how to put together a note box, you could start with lesson five where the character traits begin. Because right, we're in the midst of working on creating a character profile to give us the power of living characters. Well, lesson 18 of 35, guess what? We're at the halfway point. Can you believe it? We're halfway through the course. Isn't that spectacular? So, does that mean we're on the downhill slide? It's going to be easy from here. Nope. We are entering the danger zone. No, I mean, I have to get serious here because we've covered all of the easy, easy character traits. And we're now entering into the territory where the character traits become a little more problematic and there's more danger that you might find yourself triggered or otherwise emotionally upset during the discussion of these. Now we've tried to practice with characters. They're just fictional characters. We, we're writers here, we're not psychologists. We give a fictional character a trait, and then we see how he behaves. So hopefully, we can hold these emotions in our hands and say, oh, interesting emotion. But if that doesn't happen, and if it starts, if it really starts upsetting you, turn off the video and back away, because then you're out of my gifts, because I'm not a psychologist, and you, you, if it's really, really triggering you, please back away. That's not for that purpose. So, I say that we're entering the danger zone. Well, let's take a quick look at the re last week's trait because it's pivotal. Just as lesson 17 or 18, between them, they're half, 17.5 is half the way through 35. And lesson 17, on when we talked about moderation was really the perfect tipping point between super safe and ooh, I don't know. Because what we found that in the victory state of moderation, moderation is the poster child of the balance variables. It's, you know, you've always heard the phrase, all things in moderation. And in the victory state, you have the ability to say yes to things to a certain level and say, no, thank you, I've had enough. And it's that ability to say yes and the ability to say no that are really uh, characteristic of the moderation trait. However, in the lost state, what's lost is self-respect. And in fact, the lost state of moderation is the doorway to self-destruction. That's the tipping point where things get dangerous. We didn't go into any kind of depth on that issue, but obviously there are any number of ways in which you can go, you can fail in moderation and in ways that end up destroying dignity and destroying one's very self. Um, one can only think of a drug like fentanyl, for example, which can turn you either turn you into a zombie or or take your life so um, this is the tipping point where things get dangerous so being aware that things might become a bit dangerous for us we're going to go ahead and launch into this week's character trait see if you think this feels dangerous respect 
respect. Wait a minute. We've had affability. We've had courtesy. We've had kindness. Respect. Wow. How can that be a whole separate character trait? And how can it be dangerous? Well, the danger part we'll see. But how it can be different, a whole different one, I have to give you a little bit of explanation that I'm going to tell you ahead of the scenarios so that you don't have to wait impatiently to learn it. This respect, when you talk about courtesy, which is very, very similar to respect, courtesy was giving respect to all persons just because they're a human being. By virtue of their humanity, every person is due a certain level of respect. That's what courtesy is about. Whereas respect by itself has to do with the respect that a person is owed by virtue of their station in life or their status. Um, for example, when we think about uh, not so long ago in Italy, I've heard tell that if a pregnant woman set one foot off the curb, the cars in both directions would come to a screeching halt and stay halted until she crossed the road. They gave her that respect just by virtue of her pregnancy. Um, kids, when I was growing up, if the principal came into the room, all of the students in the class would stand. You know, uh, yes, I'm 76, and that was quite a while ago when I was in elementary school, but that was the respect that we used to give to the principal. Well, even today, in a courtroom, when the judge enters, all rise and everyone stands. That's what we're talking about for respect. Okay, so we'll save the rest for analysis, and it's time to talk about the scenarios. Matthew knew that his family was a little bit different, but he didn't mind it whatsoever. In fact, he was a little bit, if he had to admit, he was a little bit proud of it. It kind of set his family apart. You see, his family was rather formal. Aunt Ella ruled the roost, and all of his friends learned very, very quickly when they come into his house, their house, you're quiet and calm when you enter what Aunt Ella called the front room. And you always walked over to Aunt Ella and greeted her before you went up to Matthew's room. <laughs> well, once you were in Matthew's room, you could kid and joke around and laugh and be silly and all of the ways that kids normally were. But they had a certain formality as to father mother, uh, and certainly to Aunt Ella. Respect. Consequently, when Matthew was in school and he saw one of his classmates just openly sass back the teacher, his, his stomach just wanted to churn. Respect. Later on, when he got to, to college and he got to know a little more about the world, he began to wonder. He looked around at the way grown-ups were behaving around him, the adults in the world and the positions of authority, and he began to wonder, should this respect stuff be given automatically or shouldn't people even if they're in figure in a position of high authority, shouldn't they actually have to earn their respect? He was that was definitely one thing that college made him ponder. Hmm. Respect. Ralph was having a hard time getting used to his new job. Paid a lot less money but he was thankful to actually have a job. You see, he used to be the manager of a medium-sized grocery store that served their small community, well, 
frankly, ever since the end of World War II, when his cousin's grandparents opened the store. And he'd worked at the store when he was in school, and he'd risen up to being the manager of the store. Well, a Walmart moved in, and the business of the store went down, down, down. Ralph took a pay cut to try to keep the place alive. But it turned out that he was one of the people who went around on the final day and closed all the blinds and heard the door close. His cousin locked it, and the grocery store was gone forever. He was glad to have a job as produce department manager for the Walmart, but it really, really graded him when his boss came through, waltzing through the department with his clipboard in his hand with little diagrams of how corporate wanted the produce department laid out. Kid, well, he was 28, but to Ralph, he seemed like a kid. And or he was the authority figure, and Ralph just had to grit his teeth. But he was, really didn't know where to draw the line because the guy was saying, pointed to how corporate said, we that big display, it needs to be out front, and we've got to fill it with apples. Don't you know this is apple season? This is autumn. And the corporate diagram says we need apples here. Well, Ralph was an inner steaming because the apple trees in the community had just gone gangbusters that year. Everybody had more apples than they knew what to do with. If you wanted apples, you asked your neighbor. They'd give you enough to make pie and cobbler and whatever else you wanted to do. Why, if you had an apple, uh, a cider press, they'd give you a whole bushel of apples with spots and whatnot that weren't quite put in your mouth ready. Why on earth would he want to have a great big giant display of out-of-state apples? They're just going to sit there and rot. So, so Ralph, all he could do was say, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Do you suppose I could get a little of your time this afternoon for, to discuss as an important matter? And that's all he could do was hope and pray that when he had his little meeting, with the manager of the store that he could talk some sense into the guy about the apples. Respect. Okay. At this point in time, you are probably getting a little bit sick of this whole respect. Well, I'm calling it the respect cluster or the courtesy cluster. Uh, you know, ever it doesn't have a real name, but you know, affability, courtesy, kindness, and respect, they, they're so similar to one another. Why are they all so separate? Well, the reason why they're all so separate is because we're stewing them in the less verbal part of the brain. And the less verbal part of the brain stores things by emotions, whereas our rational brain wants to categorize, compare, unite and find similarities. And certainly the rational brain can find all kinds of similarities between these four character traits, but because they all are based on different struggles or different roles within the struggle, they have different emotions associated with them and the less verbal brain does not put things together and compare them rationally. The emotions are different, they're different. So, we have to, that's why we have to study them individually because we're using them for the power of emotions and we're, we're going to tackle that head on when we get to our profile tool segment of the class today. So what we have to realize is because the emotions are tied to the struggle and we want to store them in the less verbal part of our brain, or actually the less verbal part already knows the emotions, we want to ta attach our word to that emotion. And so therefore we have to deal with them separately. So let's take a look at the triad of emotions. This picture should look quite similar to you. It's the situation where the alpha animal has to face a charge from the beta animal. Wait a minute. That was kindness. That was the picture for kindness. 
Uh-huh. I cut it out and pasted it on this one. The very picture of kindness. How come it's a different struggle? Because we're looking at it from the point of view of the beta animal. With kindness, the alpha animal was anything but kind. <laughs> He'd do injury to the animal that was challenging him. He was out for cruelty to that animal. So it was the lost side of kindness. But here we see it from the point of view of the beta animal, where the beta animal basically gets to make a choice. Am I going to sit here and watch that alpha animal eat all the food and maybe I won't even get any? Or should I rise up and go into rebellion and challenge him? Well, if he's stronger than me, I'm going to come away limping. If I'm lucky, I could end up dead. Ooh, struggle, struggle. Do I make a rebellion? Do I put up a challenge or don't I? That is, that is a pretty dangerous struggle when you think about it. And you don't have to go very far into the human condition to come up with some analogies that will show just how dangerous that is. So therefore, the lost side is the rebellion. Okay, wait a minute now. Aren't there some times when rebelling against somebody awful might be a good thing? And sitting there waiting to see what the villain is going to leave left for the rest of us is supposed to be the victory side? Sure, peace, tranquility, but is the peace and the tranquility worth it? At what point do you have to start standing up? Ah, does that mean there's two lost sides? No. This respect is not a balance variable. Pardon me. A not a balanced character trait. It's a, an empathy character trait. And empathy character traits have one lost side and one victory side. So how do we make sense of that? I told you we were getting into the difficult ones. Well, the orientation of the character trait is presumes that we are working in a perfect world. If we were in a perfect world where with only laws that were just, only rulers who were just, only parents who were loving, then everyone deserve everyone that you had to give respect to would indeed be deserving of respect. And it would indeed be a sad loss if you rebelled against such wonderful leaders, such just laws, such loving parents. So we have to pick a polarity. Does that mean that you, as a writer, have to say, okay, divine right of kings? No, 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 no. You're the writer. You get to write it any way you want to write it. But if you want to understand what's called the lost state and what's called the victory state of respect, you need to understand the orientation. The, or the orientation is in a perfect world. And let's hope we someday get to a perfect world. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'd love it. I wouldn't want to get to the, a world where everything you ran into and everyone you ran into just was deserving of rebellion and disrespect. That would be a world I'd want to avoid. But that's why it gets dangerous. And that's why I'm happy to say that just as authors, we get, to, we get to control that to whatever level we as authors feel comfortable exploring that. Okay, so next we have to look at just, let's take a quick look at this empathy group. It's growing rapidly. We have, so far we have six and we have seven more to go for 13 total. We have responsibility and loyalty seem a lot alike. And of course, we're familiar with how alike these guys are. And then we're going to find in the empathy group that we're going to see these clusters. And we're going to, that's two of the traits 
are going to be so close together that we're going to be taking a look at maybe covering them on the same lesson. Okay, so now we get to the fun part. Remember at the very, 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 very first class, the very first lesson, the very first video, I made you guys a promise. I promised you that by the end of the class, you, the, I could give you tools that would enable you to reconnect with the story you were writing the minute you sit down to write. Because, of course, that's a big, big chunk of the problem of having to write in little fragments of time. How do you write a consistent, coherent story if you only get short periods of time in which to write? And the biggest challenge was, well, how do you even get your head back into your story fast enough to make good use of 15 minutes if that's all you've got available to write? And I promised you in lesson one that you would be able to reconnect with your story the minute you sit down to write. Today's the day, only halfway through. Well, we've got the rest of the character traits. So if your character has only the traits we've covered so far, I can promise you, you'll be able to reconnect with your story the minute you sit down to write at this point in time. So let's see how. First of all, the place in the saga is the easy part. And in fact, we covered that in lesson four. Do you remember when we talked about tracking the story arc? And we said we would use the 4350 if it's just a fragment, or 4450 for our first project, 4550 for our second, etc. The 50 part there tells us that that's where we're storing our story arc. And in this case, we, we played around with a story where the princess meets uh, the prince who's been enchanted, and he looks like a frog. So here we are. We sit down, and we're, we're at the spot. We're going to write scene two where the princess actually meets the frog. And the star, remember, tells us anytime we see a star, on any card, that means there's information on the back. We flip it over and we say, oh yeah, it was on our journal 14 on page 12. We just got to the spot where the princess stopped at the pool to water her horse and she sees the frog. Ta-ta, place in the story. Done, lesson four. Great, but of course that's, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the problem. You know, yes, it was nice to be able to see right where you were and you didn't have to flip through your journal and read two pages to figure out where you were. Yes, it was faster. But the real challenge is to get yourself into the emotional state of what was going on in that story. You want to connect with the emotions of the story so that your, your story will flow smoothly and consistently. So the, some of that will come about from the place in the saga. For example, if a princess steps down to water her horse, she might not be shocked to see a frog in the pond. But if the frog speaks to her, she's going to be surprised. And that came out of the place in the saga. But we are going to be dealing with times and situations where the emotions are going to be far more complex than just surprise. And that's what we're going to focus on right here, right now, in the remaining part of this lesson. Well, how do you engage with emotions? How does emotions and memory, how do they connect? Well, I'm going to give you an example of, of something that they teach language students. Uh, if you, I was studying Spanish. I, I still have a Spanish coach. Hopefully one day you'll get to meet her. She's a student in our class. She lives in Colombia. Hi, Juliana. Here is an example 
of a way to learn a Spanish verb. The verb is caber, which means to fit. And the trick that, that they tell you, and it does work, it's really kind of fun, is you picture a ridiculous scene, something or something that has a surprise or some kind of emotional punch, and you define that location, and then you put images into it that sound like the word, and then your less verbal brain is spectacular at remembering locations and emotions. You put those two together, and it will bring you back cab and bear. It's not nonverbal, it's less verbal. So that is how uh, those learning a language have learned how to use the less verbal side of their brain to help. Caber means to fit. The picture is a big brown bear. Doesn't really fit inside the taxi cab. So the, the visual, the location is the taxi cab with the bear hanging out. The element of emotion is surprise. What's a bear doing in a taxi cab? And will it fit? Ah, caber to fit. So it comes about in our less verbal part of the brain. If you wonder, well, why is the less verbal part of our brain so equipped at tying emotions to locations? Well, I'd invite you to think back in your memory because I bet you've got examples in that. Like, for instance, uh, my friend Mel in one of his podcasts talks about how he walked past this fenced in yard with these really mean dogs that charged up against the fence. Well, that's very startling and that's frightening. He probably can't walk past that fence again. He can't get into that scene, that location, without that fear coming back up. And you could see how for uh, us, as we were coming into existence from our more primitive society, those locations could mark danger. Oh yes, that's where the lion hid. Oh yes, that's where snakes are curled up in that crevice. So locations and emotions have been very tied to our survival from the earliest, earliest days of mankind. And so we, can, we just saw an example of how those who want to learn vocabulary words can use that to their aid. Now we're going to look at something that's a little bit more dramatic, more complex, and more amazing because of how powerful it is. We're going to talk about the world of a memory expert. These are guys that enter contests for memory. They will give them like 50 words. One, one. Just kind of recite them at a a monitored pace, and then, okay, we're done. Give me the words. And the memory expert can recite them all off. Boom, 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 boom. And I say, can you recite them backwards? Yep. Boom, 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 boom. How about every other one? Boom, 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 boom. Every third one backwards? Boom, 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 boom. They can just do it. Insanely, insanely, insanely complex memory tasks. They've never saw that list of words before, and they can memorize each word in a split second. I, they are definitely using the less verbal side of their brain. And a common way of describing a very, very common tool to do this is something that they, that's called a memory palace. So here's how it works. This is like a foyer, just the first room, because if you're going to memorize 50 things, you're going to need more than 10 objects. You might or have a room with 10 objects, and 10 rooms with 10 objects would cover 100. Here's the point. The memory expert knows their memory palace like they live in it. They know every location. They really, really, really study their memory palace. They've used it for years. They're comfortable in it, and they know their way through it. So, for example, the foyer, the front door, he's standing at the front door, he comes in, the rug in the middle of the foyer, and then the window that looks out, the picture on the wall. Um, that's a coat rack. 
It's a coat rack. A, sh a chandelier hanging from the top. Yes, it's a chandelier. A mirror. A bench. A chair. No, it doesn't belong in the bathroom. It's a chair. And the door leaning out. What were you thinking? Point. The memory expert knows this path tremendously well. He gets a word. Baseball. He glues it to the front door by thinking, bam. He throws the baseball at the front door. Bam. Baseball. And he notes that the knobs kind of look like baseballs. Boom. I've got to get it. A little punch of emotion. Yes. Baseball. Then you come to the next one, rug. And someone tells him, cat. Oh, give me an easy one. The cat is curled up on the rug. Oh, oh, he's purring. Oh, oh, what a, oh, what a tender, sweet, loving cat. Third one, window. Asparagus. That's going to be hard, right? Well, look at the slats in the window. They're like asparaguses. He just pictures asparagus instead of the window bars. Asparagus. Oh, isn't that silly? Ha, 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 ha. Asparagus for the window bars. And so on. Every word gets tied to something. Now, you want to go forward. Baseball. Cat. Asparagus. I bet you can go backwards. Didn't have any trouble, did you? What about every other one? Just as easy, right? And that's how they do the memory palace work. So what that tells us is that the less verbal part of the brain can learn a lot of words quickly and can tie them to a location with a pop of emotion. And that is the mechanism that we are using with the memory profile diagram. So let's turn the page. That should be a little bit familiar. Remember Stuart? He was our guy that grew up in an awfully abusive household. He has no sense of responsibility because he was never taught it. He has no loyalty because no one in his household is loyal to him. And he's got just barely a touchable some affability because every once in a while he and his friends are actually nice to each other but not very often. So that's Stuart's character profile diagram. Well, we, let's say that you're getting ready to sit down to write a scene. We're going to be sitting down to write the scene. Remember we said that Stuart rushed up to poor Nick Nick got off the bus at the wrong stop, and when he set his backpack down to get out his cell phone to, to call his friend to see what he should do, Stuart came rushing by, grabbed his backpack, jumped on his bike, and rode off, and then he crashed his bike into the gutter. So now we're about to write the scene where Nick comes running up to help Stuart. So how are we going to bring this, get our emotions of these two characters into the right positions. Well, are we going to go from analysis of the scene to emotion? Well, is that how the mind works? The tiger jumps out of the tree and heads to the hunter. The hunter sees the tiger and says, ah, tiger. Tiger is ferocious. Tiger has claws. Tiger might be hungry. Oh, I better work up the emotion of fear. No, that's not how the brain works. We know how the brain works. The tiger jumps out and the hunter goes, Yeek! the emotion comes first. And then the analysis. Skedaddle fast as can be. Whew, he must not have been hungry. Or, in the more modern world, car rushes past, eek, you jump back up on the curb, heart still beating. Your analysis says, now, 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 look both ways a little bit better next time. 
It's okay. The danger is past. Calm down, calm down. It's always the emotion comes first and then drives the analysis. So what we need to do when we look, we need to, before we can write that scene where we're going to pit Stuart and Nick against, put them both into a scene together. Remember, here's, here's Nick's uh, character profile diagram. We have to get the emotions back into the right state. We can easily find our location. That's the analysis side of things. So Stuart crashes his bike, and Nick is going to help him up. That's the analysis side. That's our find our place in the story using our story art cards. But we're going to use the character profile diagram to resurrect the emotional state of our characters. And we're going to do it using the very mechanism that we saw the memory expert do. And we might not be perfect experts, so we might have to look at our memory prompt list. They don't get to, but we can. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually go around the character profile diagram. I suggest actually touching the character trait. And when we touch the character trait, we think of the little micro scenario that we had in our minds when we wrote, when we placed that character trait. Remember we talked about placing a character trait, how we wrote it first on the memory prompt list, we related it, and then we placed it where it went. So in this case, we would touch it, hopefully not have to look, but if we do have to look, his father's yelling at him. His father's yelling at him and for no good reason. And so he, he, he's a hard time with affability. He just, what does that, how does it feel when you're just expecting somebody to jump out at you at every minute? I'm on my guard. I don't know about you. Loyalty. His brother teased him in front of his friends. You don't have loyalty to anybody. I'm loyal. I'm loyal to me. Just me. That's I only. I, only me. I can't trust anyone, and I'm not gonna be trustworthy to anybody. Hmm. Responsibility. He wouldn't take responsibility when he knocked over that lamp. There's no way he would take it. No one could prove he did it, and by golly, he wasn't going to do it. And his brother wouldn't take responsibility when he knocked over his blocks, even though he was sitting right there. So he's not going to have any sense of responsibility either. Don't blame me. I'm not admitting to anything. So there's Nick. Can you feel Nick? Well, what are we going to do? I mean, pardon me. Can you feel Stuart? Pardon me. Now here's Nick. Nick grew up in such a loving household. He was shown responsibility, loyalty, affability. We can go through and remember each of those things and orderliness. We can just connect with how confused he felt when, oh no, what am I going to do now? I don't have the right bus stop. So these guys are base traits for Nick. So Nick is so affable and loyal and responsible that even though Stuart grabbed his backpack and rode off with it, when he sees when he sees Stuart crash his bike, his heart goes out to him and he runs over to him. See, now we're already in the correct emotional state. We have these two characters ginned up emotionally, and we can write the dialogue between them right where we left off, and we don't need any more than that prompt card, that story arc, and our character profile diagram. See how it works? So this will get you to the spot. Don't, I would say, I would go so far as to say, the minute you sit down to write, don't write any words down if it's been any reasonable break. You've had a break of emotion that, you, that you're not connected with your story anymore. Touch 
the character traits. Travel around the character profile diagram. Be the character like a method actor. What if you had to go on stage and portray Stuart? You had to go on and you're going to improv theater and you're going to be Stuart. How would you act? Get yourself in that state before you write. And we know, we know because we did it, that we can say, can't we? Baseball, cat, asparagus. I bet you could have done it. Tell me backwards. See? See how fast you could do it? And that's why I say you'll be able to reconnect with your characters the moment you sit down to write. So that's our lesson for today. I hope you enjoyed it. it. We might be downhill in terms of we're getting closer and closer every time now to the conclusion of the course, but I can't say that they're going to get any easier because we are entering the domain of controversy. So thank you. Bye-bye.